Welcome to Understand Murdoch, a podcast from the Post and Courier, South Carolina's largest newspaper. Our award-winning reporters have spent more than a year digging into the Murdoch saga to bring you the latest news and in-depth analysis as we cover the story of drugs, deceit, and death in South Carolina's rural low country. I'm Glenn Smith, editor of the newspaper's Watchdog and Public Service team. I'm here with Avery Wilkes, an investigative reporter who's been covering this Murdoch case with me for well over a year now. Hi, great to be here as always. There has been a lot going on in the Murdoch cases lately. We've covered most of it in the paper and on postandcourier.com over the past couple of weeks, but we haven't had a chance to get to everything here on the podcast yet. So we thought we would take a few minutes to go through each of those developments here and to try to catch everyone up on where things stand as we move beyond the holiday season. To that end, Glenn, one big development that you covered in mid-December was the indictment of Alec Murdoch on new tax evasion charges. Those charges brought the total number of criminal counts against Murdoch to nearly 100, just from the state grand jury alone. What were the big revelations from that recent indictment? Well, yeah. So when that came down, it wasn't entirely surprising because this has been sort of a time-honored tradition of the feds uh, going back decades, right? Al Capone in the 30s. So the fact that he'd been accused of stealing all this money and not reporting it on his taxes, that's sort of a backstop, a good bankable set of offenses to hold him accountable for. Okay. What the indictments show was that during a period between 2011 and 2019, Murdoch is accused of stealing failing to report $6.9 million in ill-gotten income. Um, The indictments say he owes nearly $487,000 in state taxes now. And this makes the state of South Carolina one of Alex Murdoch's many creditors. The thing that was really interesting about this set of indictments, though, is it gave a rare look inside Murdoch's income during this period. So he pulls in about $14.3 million, making tons of money, legitimate money from his law practice. But even during this period, even when he's doing very well, he's still supposedly stealing lots of money from clients, his former law firm, and others. 2014, let's take that for instance. He's accused of stealing $25,000, even though he made nearly $5.3 million that year. 2017 was the worst year during this period. He makes only $270,000. That, you know, to put that in perspective, that is seven times the median household income in Hampton County, where he's based. So even it's just a staggering amount of money that's passing through uh, his coffers. And like I said, even when he's flush, he seems to be putting his hand in the till. So, yeah, Glenn, I think the the really interesting thing that we learned from this, as you said, was just how much money Murdoch was actually making from his day job. This is something that we did not know before, even though there were tons of questions about, you know, uh, just how how bad were his money problems that he needed, you know, to steal from his clients and, and from people who who trusted him in order to pay up, pay down his debts and, uh, you know, cover his losses. And, and so now we learn that his money problems must have been really, really bad because he was making millions of dollars, uh, you know, in legitimate income at his job and also allegedly stealing nearly $9 million uh, over the course of a decade. So these charges, these new charges all carry up to five years in prison, but Murdoch was already facing decades and decades of jail time on the other financial crimes. So these new counts really don't impact the potential prison sentence Murdoch faces, right? Yeah, that's right. State prosecutors have already indicated in legal filings that they plan to seek life in prison on the financial crimes. So this is really just icing on the cake for them. And maybe it even offers Murdoch even more incentive to agree to some sort of plea deal before trial on the financial charges. It's also worth noting that this is yet another financial crime indictment from the state grand jury. We've seen a lot of questions and speculations about where the feds are on this. Obviously, the U.S. Attorney's Office indicted Murdoch, accomplice Russell Lafitte, the former CEO of Palmetto State Bank, and a jury in November convicted Lafitte on all six financial charges against him. But people are wondering, why have the feds not charged Murdoch as well? What insight do you have into that, Eve? Yeah, that's a question I'm seeing a lot. And I answered this for our premium newsletter subscribers yesterday. But my sense is that the feds won't indict Alec Murdoch at all as things stand. I, I should couch this and say that things could always change as the circumstances in this case evolve. But uh, but as of now, I do not expect the feds to indict and prosecute Murdoch. There are a few things at play here, I'm told. 
One is the frosty relationship between the South Carolina Attorney General's Office, which is the state in this case, and the U.S. Attorney's Office for South Carolina, which are the feds. Those two sides have worked together uh, on a lot of cases in years past, including investigations into corrupt sheriffs and the $9 billion VC summer nuclear fiasco. But there have also been plenty of behind the scenes turf wars about who gets to indict whom, who goes first in prosecuting, and, and who gets the credit on these cases. As I understand it, the state has essentially laid claim to Alec Murdoch and his myriad criminal acts. The double murder case, the financial crimes, the drug trafficking and money laundering, all of it. And the feds have agreed to handle the Russell Lafitte side of things. So that's sort of the division of labor that has been reached. Um, there's also something called the Pettit policy. And this is not an enforceable rule or a law, but the U.S. Department of Justice has a policy that says the feds generally won't follow the state in prosecuting a defendant for the same crime, the same criminal acts, unless there's something else going on, some compelling reason for the feds to get involved. Can you give us some idea of what might constitute a compelling reason? There are a number of scenarios. Uh, I'll go through some some hypotheticals uh, that, that, again, may not apply to this case, uh, but if they do, could could give the feds some excuse, some reason to enter into this case and indict Murdoch. So that's what I meant when I said, you know, circumstances could change. So uh, one example, perhaps the state charges and prosecutes the defendant, but doesn't win a conviction at trial. Uh, maybe the state tries the case and gets convictions on some of the charges, but not others. Um, maybe the state's case falls apart before trial and they can't prosecute at all. Or maybe the state reaches a, a plea deal that the feds believe is too lenient and doesn't appropriately address the defendant's wrongdoing. Or maybe even the state wins convictions at trial, but the judge uh, passing out the sentence awards a super lenient sentence. All of those could be reasons for the feds to come in to say, look, um, you know, state, you took your swing at this, but we don't think you, um, you know, you got the justice that that this bad guy uh, deserved. Uh, and so it gives them a reason to come in and press their own charges and seek more punishment for the defendant. So uh, in that way, federal prosecutors in these big joint investigations can serve as a backdrop for the state. And we've certainly seen that in the past around here in a few high profile cases. Uh, think back to 2015's uh, manual AME church shooting. Uh, the feds and the state pursued dual parallel prosecutions against Dylan Roof, the shooter. Also, uh, same thing occurred with uh, North Charleston policeman Michael Slager, former North Charleston policeman, who's accused and convicted of shooting Walter Scott after a traffic stop. Um, it's also some, some odd places it's turned up. Uh, connection, say, with the 2009 uh, killing of Brittany Drexel, who was a, a teen who was down in Myrtle Beach on spring break who disappeared. Uh, they brought up, the feds went after a suspect back in 2016 who had already been convicted in armed robbery in Mount Pleasant and was serving state probationary time connection with that. They went after the suspect saying, well, we didn't feel like the, the state penalty was severe enough in this instance, but a lot of observers thought that they were using this dual prosecution as a way of squeezing details out of him because he had been implicated in the Drexel case by a jailhouse informant that ended up being a lot of bunk in the end. Anyway, some good examples there, but uh, what, what is the point, Avery, of this Pettit policy? There are a few reasons for it. It comes out of a 1960 U.S. Supreme Court case, which was Pettit versus the United States, where double jeopardy became a major issue. Uh, the policy is meant to save prosecutorial resources and to protect defendants from the financial burden of having to go through multiple trials for essentially the same conduct. Uh, it's also supposed to promote better coordination and cooperation between state and federal prosecutors. So the state and the feds are supposed to get together at some point in the course of their investigation and decide which of them is best suited to charging and prosecuting uh, certain crimes or certain defendants in question. And I'm told that the feds typically prefer to be invited into these kinds of cases rather than uh, barging in on their own and uh, you know feeling like they're, they're bigfooting the state. So the, the policy has a lot of 
of good uses. And it, it's mostly, as I said, meant to save resources and to uh, sort of limit the kind of tension that can develop between between the feds and the state on, on these types of cases. So in this Murdoch case, those conversations have already taken place between the state and the feds, and this is the division of labor they've agreed upon. Is that right? That's right, as my understanding, that the state is taking Alec Murdoch and the feds got Russell Lafitte, as we saw uh, in November. Now, what happens with the other defendants, I don't know. Uh, the state has indicted Curtis Eddie Smith, Corey Fleming, Jerry Rivers, and Spencer Roberts on charges alleging that they were all involved in one Murdoch scheme or another. But the feds have indicted only Lafitte so far. Uh, so that remains to be seen. It, it should, I should note that it, it sort of goes the other way as well. So I don't expect that we're going to see the state go forward with the charges they've already pressed against Russell Lafitte. So since the feds have gone and uh, won convictions on, on the fraud charges against Lafitte, you know, you don't expect the state to go and, and you know, press their case to trial because, uh, again, we're, we're saving prosecutorial resources here. Uh, speaking of all of that, our colleague Thad Moore reported on December 7th that Russell Lafitte is seeking a new trial. Glenn, you edited that story. Why does Lafitte think he should get one? So this is a really interesting case. Uh, Lafitte's lawyers alleged the jury was rushed to make a decision before the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, if you recall, if you followed this case at all, it was a really chaotic, unprecedented end to the jury deliberations that day. Judge Richard Gergel removed and replaced two jurors with alternates. Ten hours into the deliberations, it was going on and on into the night, and it looked like they weren't going to come to any conclusion. There was all these counts and there were all these elements of these counts they had to consider. Notes began to come in from the jury room complaining about jurors being pressured to change their votes and about them having medical and anxiety issues. Lafitte's lawyers seemed to be implying that the two jurors who were replaced were on their client's side. Seems to be something to support that and the fact that the jury deliberated for just 45 minutes after the replacement before finding Lafitte guilty on all six counts. Um, that's followed up by a December 20th hearing saying that the two jurors had signed affidavits detailing improper influences on jury deliberations, quote unquote. Here's another quote from the filing. The sole justification for insisting on moving forward with alternate jurors and asking the jury to begin deliberating anew at 9 p.m. was the concern for the impending holidays, the lawyers wrote. That is hardly a justification for a decision which ultimately violated one of Mr. Lafitte's most cherished rights. And the U.S. Attorney's Office responded with their own filing on December 22nd, uh, basically opposing this, this effort by Lafitte's attorneys. W what did they have to say? Well, uh, bottom line, they said the convictions should stand. They defended Judge Gergel's decision to replace the jurors, and they supported that with a 56-page filing. It was just stacked with references to past cases where jurors had been replaced and not challenged. Um, the prosecutors also argued that Lafitte's attorneys should have lodged their complaints about the replacements in the courtroom, not in a post-trial motion. Lafitte's attorneys agreed to remove one of the jurors and said they had no objection. So this fight remains pending as of the time we're recording this. So moving on now to the double murder case. For starters, shortly after Avery reported it on December 20th, the Attorney General's office confirmed that they would not be seeking the death penalty for Alec Murdoch. Does that come as any surprise, Avery? Uh, no. Uh, we've been hearing for a while, though obviously not on the record and, and not in a way that we could report, that prosecutors were not going to be seeking capital punishment in this case. And I think it would have been really hard to convince a jury to sentence someone to execution in a case that relies entirely on circumstantial evidence, as this one does. And it would, of course, have added a lot of complexities and delays to this case. And that was one of the main things that we saw in a, a statement after this decision was reached by Murdoch's defense team. They, they said that they welcomed the decision and, uh, and noted that it means that there aren't going to be any delays uh, that would stop the January 23rd trial from going forward on schedule. So really the only question that that we had was, A, uh, when are they going to announce this or are they going to announce it at all that they're not seeking the death penalty? Uh, and B, <laughs> when can we feel comfortable enough to to report that and to, to try to break that news? Uh, the deadline was December 24th uh, to, to give notice that they would be seeking the death penalty. That was Christmas Eve. 
Um, but we felt more comfortable a few days before with our sources to uh, go ahead and, and, and try to break that news and report it, uh, that they were not going to seek the death penalty. And then, of course, right after our story came out, I think maybe an hour later, the attorney general's office released their official statement, uh, not really explaining their decision, but uh, just stating that they would not be seeking the death penalty in this case. Well, speaking of circumstantial evidence, there's a major fight over the state's high impact blood spatter analysis in which an outside expert reportedly found more than 100 spatter stains on the shirt Alec Murdoch was wearing on the night of the slayings. Murdoch's attorneys have called that analysis into question for a number of reasons, all of which we've covered earlier. And the state seemed to concede there could be some significant problems with that evidence. What's the latest on that front, Avery? Yeah, Murdoch's attorneys seem to have landed some body shots here, but it still remains to be seen whether they have a knockout blow with this impact spatter analysis. Essentially, what the judge has done since the last time we talked about this on the podcast is to order the state to turn over a lot more evidence related to this outside blood spatter analysis. Uh, That analysis was completed by a former Oklahoma police officer named Tom Bevel, who goes around the country testifying in trials about blood spatter. Uh, Judge Newman ordered the state to turn over all communications between the state and Bevel, uh, any electronic or physical documents sent to or received from Bevel during the investigation, all of Bevel's Photoshop files, uh, and that was because Bevel used Photoshop to analyze photos of the shirt and also a copy of Bevel's case file. So uh, in essence, this is exactly what Murdoch's legal team asked for, and the defense offered no objection to them getting it. Um, These communications and records could help prove Murdoch's case that state investigators manipulated this expert Uh, to get a report finding impact spatter on Murdoch's shirt where actually none existed, or uh, it could exonerate the state and show that there was no such influence by the state. So um, this is still pending. Uh, We don't know exactly what the state's response is going to be toward this. Uh, As we mentioned earlier, uh, the state prosecutor in this case, Creighton Waters, said that you know, he would have to do his own sort of mini investigation to determine whether this analysis is still viable, uh, whether it can be or should be introduced at trial, or whether, uh, you know, they, they now need to, to go in another direction and uh, potentially leave this out of trial. Uh, so that should go a long way uh, in determining whether this impacts batter evidence makes it into the, the trial that's coming up. So, so why is that such a big deal? Like, can you give me some idea? Like, what, what's the over under on this coming in? Like, how does it help the state's case to have this come in? And, and how big of a win would it be for Murdoch's lawyers to keep it out? Yeah, it's a great question. We first found out about the, the presence of impact spatter as part of the state's case. Uh, probably back in, in the spring of 2021, there was a story in Fitz News about uh, spatter and what it means for the case. Uh, And that story was obviously based on anonymous sources, and we didn't really get on the record confirmation of this until probably a couple of months ago. But the reason impact spatter is an important part of the state's case is because, again, this is a circumstantial evidence case. There is no witness saying that they saw Murdoch commit the crime. Um, You know, there's no videotape of Murdoch committing the crime. There's no a uh, record of him confessing or admitting to it, to my knowledge. So what the state has to do is provide pieces of evidence, forensic analysis, um, you know, the motive is going to be a big part, but they have to make the case to the jury and put together all these pieces of evidence to show that Murdoch was there uh, at, you know, at or about the time that the, the killings were committed, uh, that he had the means to do it, that he had the motive to do it, uh, and and any other pieces of scientific evidence that they can show um, that, that he was very likely that the person who actually committed these slayings. So what the impact spatter evidence did or, or seemed to do was to show that Murdoch was within a few feet of Maggie and Paul as they were shot to death. Uh, impact spatter is essentially the, the matter, uh, blood and otherwise, that is ejected into the air uh, when something makes a high impact um, wound into someone else. So gunshots emit a lot of impact spatter. So if you shoot someone from point blank range, their blood is going to spew back at you and leave you dripped uh, or covered in little drops of blood. Um, So if you are uh, the person who calls in uh, 911 and says, hey, I I just found a body 
and they take your shirt and you have tons of these little droplets, likely you're going to be their top suspect because that means that you were either there or you were the shooter um, when those gunshot wounds were made. So that is why this was seen as such a big piece of evidence and, and really a central element of the state's case. And that's also why it's going to be such a big deal if they can't introduce it into trial or even if they do introduce it into trial and it backfires because Murdoch's attorneys can can make all these claims about how you know the evidence was manipulated or this is just one more example of the state uh, you know, narrowly focusing on their client and trying to uh, manipulate evidence and and otherwise, uh, you know, fashion the investigation to try to prove that he was the one that did it, rather than just going and objectively finding the killer. Yeah, as you say, in the absence of a witness, in the absence of finding the actual murder weapons, that this could prove to be a very key piece of evidence. Uh, The last thing we're going to cover here is the ongoing fight over Murdoch's alleged financial crimes, whether the state should be able to present them as evidence to the jury at the upcoming double murder trial. We know the state wants to do that because they see Murdoch's other alleged criminality as providing the motive for the June 2021 murders. Prosecutors have said Murdoch killed his wife and son to distract and delay a pair of inquiries that were digging into his finances and we're going to expose his practice of stealing from his clients and law partners to paper over his massive debts. So how did the Murdoch's legal team respond to that effort? They filed a motion on December 16th asking Judge Newman to reject that request from prosecutors. Uh, the reasons are pretty simple. They do not want the financial crimes to play a major role in the upcoming murder trial. Murdoch's attorneys have accused prosecutors of only wanting to introduce those financial crimes in order to smear Murdoch as a bad guy in front of the jury to bolster their otherwise weak case that he killed his wife and son. Uh, They've said there's no evidence at all in the state's case, which, of course, they've been reviewing uh, in pretrial discovery to link Murdoch's financial wrongdoing to the deaths of his wife and son. They wrote in this motion that there was no evidence that Maggie was seeking to divorce uh, Alec Murdoch, uh, no evidence that she had hired a forensic accountant to dig into his finances, as has been rumored and reported. And they've said there's no evidence that Maggie or Paul was threatening to expose Murdoch's financial issues. So they've described the state's theory of Murdoch's alleged motive as illogical and implausible. And essentially, they're saying there's nothing linking the financial crimes uh, into the murders, except for this theory. Uh, And they said that, you know, prosecutors have essentially just made this theory up out of thin air. But there's nothing that, you know, there's nothing out there, there no piece of evidence, according to them, uh, that proves that theory. Uh, Nothing that really supports it in, in a hard and concrete way. So now Judge Newman has the state's argument that the financial crimes are central to this case and central to Murdoch's alleged motive for killing his wife and son, and thus should be included. And the judge also has Murdoch's argument that this is all just a half-baked effort to make Murdoch look bad before a jury. Uh, And and so just like with the blood spatter analysis that we talked about a minute ago, Newman's decision on this one is going to play a key role in how this trial goes come January 23rd. And really the outcome of this case. Being it's a circumstantial case, uh, how how crucial is is it to demonstrate some sort of a motive? Yeah, great question. I I think, as as we mentioned earlier, any piece of evidence that you can get that uh, points another arrow at the defendant is going to be crucial in a circumstantial evidence case. Because again, you don't have the the pieces of evidence that would make your case, you know, the witness, the video, the the audio, the the document. Uh, But uh, so, so anything you can get, uh, and you you basically have to piece the case together around that, um, and, and and point as many fingers at your uh, defendant as possible. So, uh, so yeah, I think one big reason that motive, especially, is an important part of this is because, as as the state prosecutor has said, no jury is going to convict a person for killing their wife and son, especially their son. Um, if they don't know why, you know, if you don't have uh, really perfect evidence, if you don't have a, a buttoned up case, you're you're going to have to basically tell a story. You're going to have to tell a narrative and explain to the jury um, why why he would do this, or it's just going to be really implausible for for them to believe. So again, just like the high impact spatter, this is a really key element 
of the state's case. And um, if this is excluded, if the financial crimes can't make it in, if the impact spatter can't make it in, I would be very curious as to uh, what they're going to do. You know, are they going to continue forward with this trial? Do they need to take a break and and, and reassess? You know, uh, it would be, if they if they do choose to go forward, I think it would be a signal that they believe uh, there there's other evidence that that their case can survive even without these these key elements. So that would be very fascinating to see what happens. And I do believe that most of this will get resolved one way or another before January 23rd. Yeah, I can't help but think, like those of us following the Lafitte trial, there was there was this one moment where it was revealed that a staff member at Murdoch's law firm had confronted him earlier in the day, the day of the murders, June 7th, 2021, about missing fees, that there was a bunch of missing money and put him on the spot. And he said, I, I will, I I'll get back to you on that. And then what prosecutors say is that later in the day, he's, he's just everything. The house of cards is coming down on him and he decides to kill his wife and son to engender sympathy, to buy himself some time. If that doesn't come in, if you're not be able to put the, there was an audible gasp, I think, from people in the courtroom when that evidence came in, that timing. If you can't bring that in, you can't bring in the blood spatter, like you say, I imagine it could be some rather tough sledding. That said, in, in some of the documents we've seen, there's been a lot of redactions. So there's some stuff out there that we don't know yet that, that could prove pretty crucial as well, I guess. Exactly. And what we know about this case, to be clear, is essentially being defined by uh, leaks that have come out of the case during the investigation and uh, in prosecution of it, as well as statements uh, by by both sides and um, and, and filings made, uh, you know, uh, in, in motions before these these hearings. So really what we know about the case is basically what's been told to us by, um, by, by people on both sides. And they're obviously not going to tell us anything that, that hurts their side. Uh, and, and they're also cognizant of not trying to reveal too much about their case because they don't want the other side to know too much about their strategy. So we're sort of piecing all this together as we go. And we don't have a, you know, it, it's really hard to handicap what's going to happen. It's, it would be hard to put betting odds on this trial because we just don't have the full universe of evidence that the prosecution and the legal team have. Um, but this is going to, you know, these motions, these pretrial motions are, are really critical. And I think that's why we've been giving them so much attention and so much coverage is that these really drive what the jury is going to see at trial. And depending on how the judge rules, you know, the jury may get a completely different version of this trial if the judge, you know, sides with the prosecutors on all of these requests versus if the judge sides with the defense attorneys. Um, you know, so it's going to be fascinating to see how these issues play out in the next two or three weeks. Okay, thanks, Avery. Well, that's all for now. As always, stay tuned with the Post and Courier for the latest updates in this case. You can follow us on Twitter, postandcourier.com. You can find all the latest coverage on our Murdoch landing page. We would love if you would send us questions, feedback, and tips to our Murdoch email address. That's murdoch at postandcourier.com. Please also take a minute to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, especially if you like the show. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you next time.